Um, we're looking at now what do we try to do to deal with the Great Depression? Okay, we in the last couple of weeks we looked at the depression, or last week or so we looked at the depression, what was happening, how bad was it? Remember, 25% of unemployment, 28% of Americans had zero income at all. Okay, some areas the unemployment rates were about 50%. Like in our area, Toledo, Ohio, Akron, Ohio saw unemployment rates in excess of 50%. So the circumstances were very serious, and we saw that how everybody was blaming Hoover, not entirely fair, but they turned in a different direction in the 1932 election. They turned to Franklin Roosevelt, and as you can see on the map here, he wins in a landslide. He gets 57.4% of the vote, still almost 40% of Americans still wanted Hoover to be president, but he didn't win states. You can see just a small number of yellow states up there on the screen um, that... that uh, President Hoover was able to win. Franklin Roosevelt comes into office and has a mindset about him, has an approach that he's going to use in terms of a, a dealing with the Great Depression. One of the things, it's reminiscent of what I said last week about that example of somebody falling overboard. That's not the moment where you teach them how to swim. You take action. You know, I work a lot with scouts. And in scouting, we do a lot of issues with first aid because you're out in the woods, you're camping, you don't always have doctors and 911 services available. So you have to know some first aid to be safe out there. And we try to teach everything to be done just the right way. But when the issues arise, sometimes you just have to take action. You can't necessarily worry, am I doing this exactly the right way? You need to help. So he says we're going to take action, we're going to take action now. Furthermore, he talks about bold and persistent experimentation. Going to try things, see if they work. If they don't, we'll scrap them and start with something new. That's a different approach than we sometimes today allow from our politicians. We expect them to get everything right the first time, but that's not how we live our lives. I know I make mistakes. I'm sure you make mistakes. We all try things that don't work out for us, and we have to go a different route at some point. And that's what he promises to do. Then there are the three R's. Relief, recovery, reform. Relief is a word we heard last week. Relief programs are programs designed to help people in need. So this is money, or these are the soup kitchens, these are government jobs, things of that nature that are helping people who are really struggling. Then there are recovery programs. These are programs designed to get the whole economy moving so that the government doesn't have to keep giving out relief, so that instead people have jobs out working in factories and, you know, and so forth, just like they did before the Great Crash. And then the final R is reform. Change things so that we don't have another Great Crash. Relief, help people in need. Recovery, help get the economy moving. And reform do something to prevent a crash in the future. So as we look through, and you look through today, the Great Depression programs of the New Deal, relief programs are things like the Civilian Conservation Corps, which gave jobs to young men so that they were no longer unemployed. They could send money back to their family, so it helped both the young men and their families. Recovery programs are programs like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which are designed to help an entire region of the country have electricity that had previously been impoverished and without electricity. And reform programs would be something like the Securities and Exchange Commission regulating the stock market or the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation providing insurance for your bank accounts. And you still have that. When you go to the bank today, you'll still see a sticker in the window that says FDIC. That way, if something happens to the bank, your money is insured and you will get it back. Okay? So, all of this is what Roosevelt's talking about when he pledges a new deal for the American people. He's going to do something new to help Americans out. So he gets to work, and he gets to work pretty quickly, and one of the things that he does is restore confidence. You have to keep in mind, Franklin Roosevelt had polio. And it's not true that people didn't know that. That's one of the myths about Franklin Roosevelt, that no one knew he had polio. People knew that he had polio. They didn't know he was affected as badly as he was. 
That's what they didn't know. He was paralyzed from above the waist down, from the abdomen down. He could not walk. He could not support his own weight. He put up a pretty good illusion. He wore very heavy steel braces that went from underneath his feet all the way up the outsides of his legs, all the way up above his waist. The, the joints could lock or be unlocked so that he could sit. But when in locked position, he was, he was standing on those braces. And that's a pretty hard thing to do. It's a little like being on stilts. Um, we don't think of it, but even when we appear to be standing still, there's a lot of micro-movements that are going on. We're constantly keeping our balance. And it's difficult to do that when you can't feel. So he learned to stand, always keeping something supportive. He could never have used a podium like this one on wheels. Whenever he gave speeches, they actually specially put podiums in place anchored them down so that he could stand and hang on to the podium and you would see him gesture but not with two hands always with one he taught himself how to make it look like he was walking when he was younger he could even do it with a cane or a railing uh, and not require people on both sides but eventually he would have people on both sides of him or a hand on one person and a cane on the other and he could move himself to make his legs swing forward and make it look as if he was, was walking. And his struggle to deal with polio was, was important because, you know, he'd been born pretty rich and the Roosevelt family had money and he learned to be more concerned about the situations that other people were in. First through his wife, Eleanor, when they married and she had been teaching and, and been out into the, the, some of the difficult areas of New York City where people were really struggling. And, and she took him there and showed him what life was like there. And then his polio made him more empathetic. So he was concerned about other people's circumstances. But on top of that, because of his ability to overcome this disease, when people thought his political career was over, and he still gets elected president, he has some confidence about him. He believes he can make things happen. And that confidence came through, especially on the radio. He would give what were called fireside chats. Some of them were literally given by the fireside in his home at Hyde Park. Many of them were not, but they called them fireside chats. And people had heard their president on the radio before, but not a lot. And they heard him pretty regularly first through the Great Depression and then through World War II, and it made a connection. People thought, our president cares about us, cares about what's going on, cares about our suffering. He's trying to help. And that, I think, is as important as anything else about Franklin Roosevelt was that he had this, this potential to restore people's confidence. And so he's portrayed often as sort of a good doctor, You've got a bag full of medicine there, you can see he's trying all different kinds of things to help make the patient here, the Uncle Sam figure, you can see the stars on his pants there, uh, to make him healthy again. The Congress is portrayed not very uh, beautifully off to the side, um, not really having the same kind of impact as Franklin Roosevelt did, although they had to pass all the legislation that we will read about in this section. I mean, Roosevelt couldn't just do these things on his own. The Congress had to, had to take action. We often hear about the 100 days. When a new president comes to office, they keep track. What does he do in his first 100 days? Well, Franklin Roosevelt did an amazing amount of things. He brought forth a lot of legislation, sent it over to the Congress, and they were able to act on it very, very quickly. He declared a bank holiday. Uh, to, for four days to stop people running to the banks to try to get their money. The Emergency Banking Relief Act provided um, money for the reopening of the banks and uh, put money in those banks to make them solvent again and help to reorganize banks that were not able to be reopened right away. The Agricultural Adjustment Act to help farmers with price supports. Um, the Civilian Conservation Corps provided two and a half million jobs uh, for young men, including eventually building Pokagon State Park. For those of you that have been there, that's an old CCC project. 
The Federal Emergency Relief Act put $500 million in aid to the, to the state and local governments so that they could assist people. The Public Works Administration spent almost $3.5 billion to hire the unemployed to do various kinds of public works projects, roads and dams and things like that. The National Recovery Administration was designed to try to help organize the economy to prevent strikes, to keep prices from falling too far, et cetera. This is a relatively controversial thing because as we've studied in economics, we don't tend to want our government to play that kind of a role. The circumstances were pretty extreme and so this was attempted. The Federal Securities Act, one thing it set up was the FDIC to protect bank deposits. And then there was the Tennessee Valley Authority that I mentioned earlier also to provide electricity to the Tennessee Valley. So this is how some people respond to Franklin Roosevelt. You know, doesn't Frank feel like resting just a little? The Congress struggling to keep up with all of the things that he's proposing. I wanted to put up on the board a map of the TVA just to show the size of one of these projects. And you can see all of this area in yellow is area that is being affected by the Tennessee Valley Authority. This was a poor region of the country before the Great Depression. Electricity still had not reached many of the people who were living there. And by building the hydroelectric dams at all of these different locations that you see marked in red up on the screen, you can see that electricity now is going to come to an entire region. That's going to promote economic growth and help the recovery. So Franklin Roosevelt takes office and he gets to work very, very quickly. That inspires people to be more confident that perhaps things will start to get better. And there were some improvements that did start to come about. But as we'll see, even the New Deal doesn't stop the Great Depression entirely. It'll actually take World War II to do that. 